Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking about coordination studies, why they're important, and we have an expert that's going to be walking us through this, Mr. Kareem Josephs, who is the lead power systems engineer at Eaton. So welcome, Kareem. Hey, Chris. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. We'd love to start these idea episodes off with just a high-level overview. So can you maybe explain to our listeners what a coordination study is? Sure. So a coordination study is a study performed uh, to determine how protective devices will behave when subjected to general overcurrent or even short circuit. Okay. So basically, you know, when something happens, what is going to happen? That, that's right. How can my protective device or how will it respond? Gotcha. Gotcha. Very good. So we love to get to the why. We'll get to it a little early here. So, so why should they consider a coordination study? Okay, so a coordination study is important because unless protective devices are properly set, one, they may not, they may not, I mean, your your system may not run, first of all, because generally factory settings are usually set to minimum. And a lot of times those are too low for motors and all to run for. So they need to really be looked at prior to energizing equipment. That's That's the first reason. I mean, the second reason is that your protective device may not be set to trip fast enough during a fault. So both of those are important to be able to run your equipment under normal running circumstances or conditions, and also to be able to clear a fault appropriately or fast enough. Well, you just confused me, Kareem. I thought the whole point of a breaker was just crank it all the way up and just let it go. So that's not what we're supposed to do? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> no. Yeah, even though I've seen that a lot of times done, that way, uh, you know, if, if, say, a motor trips, somebody will just bump it up a little bit more. Ah, that's still tripping. Bump it up. Ah, bump, bump it up. And now what you've done is it won't trip at all. So next time you have a fault or something happens, it may sit there and just burn up the windings of the motor and uh, you know, end up catching on fire. So that is definitely not the solution. Well, see, you're talking to an old motor shop guy, and we used to do motor repair and rewind. So I like the guys who did the, the you know, bump the breaker up, but that's for another podcast for another day. You know, that's right. I, I won't drag you down that dirt road, man. So, so but, but seriously, just to kind of help us get back, you know, if somebody wants to have one of these coordination studies done, what do they need to gather or, and to get together to, to get started? So to get a coordination study done, again, you're going to need like manufactured data curves for each of the protective devices. And then you'll need some type of logarithmic plot known as a time current characteristics curve. It's also known as a TCC curve with current. And um, the TCC curve has a basically uh, current versus time. So if you're doing it by hand, you can plot the, you can go to the manufacturer data get the respective curve for the protective device that you're looking at. And then you can plot it on this log log plot and you'll be able to tell for X amount of current, what is the time that it will take where the axis cross for this protective device to trip. And then you can plot that against the, say if it's a motor, you, you know, you get beyond the lock road of current of the motor into the full load running of the motor. And, you know, you compare those two or superimpose those two characteristics on that plot. And then you can see what effect your protective device will have on that system. Okay. And you said that was a, a time current characteristic curve? Yes, sir. Also known as a TCC curve. Okay. Very cool. So if you have that, that's pretty much the basic information to get going. Correct. Again, that's by hand. We did that, you know, we did it that way in the, in the antiquated days, in the old days. And, and now using transit analysis systems like ETAP, SKM, Easy Power, a lot of those, all those software packages actually contain TCC curve platforms in there. And they have libraries with all of the, the breaker characteristics or the protective device characteristics already in the library. So it's just a matter of selecting the device that you have and it'll pull up that characteristic for you. You don't have to draw it by hand like you used to in the olden days, in the good old days. 
in the good old days. I got you. Okay. <laughs> Very good. So that, that kind of gives us a, a, an idea of getting started. You know, one thing that comes up a lot of times with our industrial end users that, that we talk to is not everybody has a one line to get started with, too. So is that a, a needed piece of information out the gate or can you work around that? Well, as far as one lines are concerned, one lines are always useful. And having a one line will show you what protective device is connected to what piece of equipment. You can get away with wiring diagrams and three lines and stuff too, but to to show that a motor is connected to an overload, overload connected to this breaker, and then this breaker connected to this bus is is very useful when you're either modeling or you're trying to do it by hand to uh, to look at coordination of well, in this case, protection for that piece of equipment. Okay, very good. So I mean, do you have to have like you know transfer switches and things like that? Included, but does that help your coordination study? So a lot of times you'll see transfer switches used in life safety applications or when you've got, say, an emergency generator or something like that, uh, where, you know, you've got a normal utility source and then you've got an emergency source. Or you're trying to feed a board from two different sources. You have, uh, I mean, and and I don't want to get too bogged down into, you know, the different schemes, the open transfer versus you know, closed transition schemes, but the transfer switches will help to show how your system is, you know, sourced under normal circumstances versus under emergency conditions. And so, yes, having the one line to show you all of that is is definitely helpful. I would say almost necessary to be able to see how your system is you know, ultimately protected. Okay. Very good. So, Let's talk about the tangible part here. So what comes back? You know, what should our, our end user expect once a coordination study is complete? So what usually comes back is you know, you've got protected device settings and expected tripping times of the protected devices that are shown by way of the TCC curves. So, I mean, you'll get generally all the settable breakers, usually get all the settings for those. If you know what you're looking at, you can see how long it takes each protective device to trip or to clear a fault or even on overcurrent. So all of that is given in detail in the report. Okay. Now, once they get that report, is there, are there best practices or, or things that, that you've seen industrial end users use with that report? You know, do they sit down with it and literally, you know, schedule an outage day to go verify these settings? I'm just curious on what's some ways that the, the, the end user themselves They've actually implemented, you know, they've, they've taken the time to do that study. So now we want to, to cross check and implement from the plant floor standpoint. Gotcha. Gotcha. OK, so, you know, one of the things that we offer as part of our delivery approach to to our customers is the opportunity to go through the reports with them. And so one thing we'll do is we'll sit down, we'll schedule a meeting. We'll go through the, uh, you, you know, again, the executive summary is a place where we capture anything that stands out anything that 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 we feel needs to be addressed and so there's usually one or two pages worth of of verbiage in the executive summary that lets the end user know that hey this is something that we have concern about and so once that's done we'll go through we'll explain to them our findings and yes you know you you hit it right on the nose a lot of times the customer will schedule an outage to correct these issues but a lot of times, these setting changes can be made right there in the field without having to take down equipment. If a breaker is, is set a little high and you mean you're under normal running conditions, there's nothing wrong with once you've done the due diligence and you've made sure that your settings are correct and your equipment is modeled correctly, there's nothing wrong with going and backing those instantaneous settings down while the equipment is running and having it you know, adjusted there such that any type of fault will clear in the desired time that, that you would want. So yeah, some modifications can be made right there in the field without having to take the equipment down. Others would require a scheduled outage, and uh, those are equally as important to do. No doubt. And I mean, just, uh, just to throw that safety tip in there, you know, make sure we have our proper PPE when we're making those adjustments, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, you know, 
there's different types of rules or different types of studies, you know, arc flash and things like that. So how often should an uh, end user have a coordination study completed? So coordination studies kind of should be done whenever new equipment is installed from the get-go. Uh, so as soon as you put new equipment in, coordination study needs to be done. Like we were joking about in the beginning, you know, a lot of times people just set it to max or a lot of times these the it's breaker specifically. So, I mean, a fuse is a protective device also, but its characteristic is fixed. So you don't, don't really talk about that too much. But something that is dynamic that can be changed like a breaker characteristic like these electronic trip or electrically settable breakers the coordination study needs to be done to set those breakers properly for the application that is meant to protect and so basically on set as soon as the equipment is set and put in place the you know protective device needs to be set properly in addition to that as load demands change or for any reason if settings need to be revised then i would recommend having a coordination study done so it's not like with short circuit every five years depending on the utility and you know the amount of you know motors that you're adding to the system you know the short circuit reports are or analysis are generally recommended with coordination it's more of a when you touch it or as needed, we need to kind of go in and, and reevaluate and look at and possibly readjust the settings. Very good. Very good. That, that's a, that definitely helps, you know, understand, you know, the, the when and the why. So, I mean, that's, that's great. Now, let's talk about the who for a second. So, who owns the process of setting up these coordination studies typically in a plant? So, typically in a plant, you would have a plant engineer, Uh, or maintenance supervisor would own this type of process. And again, in a lot of facilities, factories, I've even seen a safety director take on this, this responsibility. But typically, you would have somebody who has electrical knowledge of coordination of, of protective device settings who would manage this process. Okay. Now, let's say you get that study back and you have a piece of equipment that as it's identified as not being properly protected, so what would that process look like from the end user standpoint to reduce that risk? The end user would be able to make protective device settings, or or have it done professionally. You know, have a have a Eaton or some other type of company come in and evaluate your protective device settings, and you want to have those done to properly protect that piece of equipment. So you know, once once it's been identified that the the device is not properly protected. Either the instantaneous is set too high and that it, you, during a fault, that piece of equipment would continue to, to contribute to the fault, to burn up, windings would burn up and so forth. And that breaker needs to be set down a little bit lower or from a nuisance standpoint, you know, every time that motor tries to turn on, the protective device is set too low and it trips over and over and over again. So you would want to have someone come in, do the coordination study. If the plant engineer is comfortable with, you know, doing the settings and has a good basis and knowledge and understanding of what they're doing, they also could revise those settings as well. Okay. Now, from your experience with looking at these coordination studies, are there any typical, you know, items that you guys see as, you know, just common areas or common mistakes that industrial users are making that, you may want to highlight, I mean, I'm thinking of simple stuff like, you know, you have a breaker that's rated too high downstream of a breaker that, you know, that's upstream of it. So, I mean, just try to get some ideas of what some, maybe some common areas to, that you find in these coordination studies. Yeah. So, you know, coordination, there's a, there's a book that was published by GE that's entitled The Art and Science of Protective Relaying. And it's not just applicable to relaying, it's applicable to uh, also to breaker setting and coordination as well. There's a art behind it as well. Uh, you know, when you look, I talked earlier about the, the TCC curves. When you are setting up TCC curves, you want to try to make devices, breakers selectively coordinate as much as possible. And by selective coordination, I mean, when you have a breaker that's downstream, say two buses downstream or two levels downstream, and you have a fault on a motor that it's feeding. The last thing you want is to have the main breaker, which is two levels up, trip for that fault, 
and then shut down the entire board with tons of other loads on there. So selective coordination is very important. It's required for life safety applications. Like, uh, you know, we talked earlier about ATSs and stuff like that. And uh, especially in the medical world where you've got a diesel generator, a standby generator waiting to come on should you lose primary power. And so I I try to selectively coordinate all the devices that I have, uh, especially to try to make sure that the devices trip in the order in which they were intended to. And, and, and so a lot of issues I see, as we alluded to in the beginning, were people just setting, especially the instantaneous region, just, just setting it to max. And when you do that, sometimes it will get into the same area of you know, a breaker, a main switchboard breaker that's two levels up. And so now if you have a fault that's large enough and that breaker is set almost the same as the main breaker, then it becomes a race as to which breaker will trip first, you know? And so for a little fault down here, two levels below, you run the risk of having the entire main switchboard shut off. So those are some of the issues that we see, the the more important issues that we see uh, out there. And, you know, we always try to have some type of level of selective coordination between these devices such that they trip in the order in which they should. Man, that was great. Now, now, what was that reference material? You said it was a GE book? Yes, uh, it's a GE book, and I can't remember. It's an older book, but it's called The the Art and Science of Protective Relaying. It's a great read. One of, one of the first books that I've read on protection. Probably been about 15 years ago now. Okay, that's great. We'll see if we can find that and maybe put that as a link uh, in the show notes for people to reference. You know, that was a wonderful answer. I mean, I think just the way you walked through all the different considerations with the coordination study, uh, that was perfect. So we love to on Eco Ask Why to get to the why, Kareem. So if, if and that just speaks to the purpose behind why would you want to even consider a coordination study? So if somebody were to pop you in the elevator and say, hey, why do I need to do this? What would be the answer? So what would be the reason to do the selective coordination study? It would be, you know, as I said before, to to make sure that not only is your equipment protected properly, but also that the user would be protected properly during the event of a fault. And also, I would say the last thing is that you don't have unintended tripping of devices further upstream for faults that are much lower down the line, i.e. you want to make sure that your devices are properly coordinated so that a fault, a localized fault is tripped by the local breaker and not by a breaker five levels upstream. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you so much, Crane. That was great. You, you really brought a lot of value, a lot of insight to the to coordination studies. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through this today. You're very welcome, Chris. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. W-H-Y dot com. <laughs>